1966, 232.8 Celsius. This doesn't have quite the same ring to it, does it? 1966, Fahrenheit 451, review and thoughts. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes, and I will get into some serious topics. And, yes, before I go any further, I absolutely acknowledge that it is not perfect. It is not. But I think that at least slightly more really, really works and really hits home than just completely misses mark and it's one of those movies I find it much too fascinating to discount even the the parts that don't completely work I find it much more interesting to look at what what were they doing and why and like yeah you know this channel is mostly about positive reviews these days so yeah that's right, I'm doing a video review of a movie adaptation of a book that specifically is about how literature is superior to other mediums. And I listened to the audiobook rather than read it. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by litter movies because that it's not that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the original the, the book, so it sucks, whether you agree with those assessments or not, this is not that review. Now, before I start talking about production, instead of me saying R.I.P. every time I say a name, you know, sadly, a lot of, you know, because of the age of the film, a lot of the most prominent people in it are dead. So I'm just going to say R.I.P. for everyone who has passed since the making of this movie here at the start. Instead of saying it every single time, I say the name of someone who has so, I realize this video is long, I'm going to do a can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie and the source material, and I will be discussing the ending. So, that brings us to... Yeah, um, the movie is technically unrated, but it should be rated PG, so will this video be. This was back when, you know, yeah, ratings ratings were very different at the time. And, I mean, I wouldn't show it to a child, but it is technically, you know, you, you can. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you absolutely show it. Like, you know, I uh, recently covered... You know, yeah, like, if I love Marvel Netflix, please do not show any of that to children. That's much too, you know, yeah, much too intense in a number of ways. But this, I mean, basically, it's, it's, there's a little bit of stuff that's maybe kind of intense for, for kids. Although, I mean, I don't know if it's that much worse than, like, classic animated Disney, so... But, but yeah, you know, I would say to properly appreciate the film, you would have to be an adult. But, yeah, technically, you know, if, you know, I think a lot of kids would find it boring, which I don't think it is, but it is not really made for children. It's just made in a way that it's not unacceptable to show it to children, basically. You know, um, yeah, you know, this is definitely, a movie. I think it's the kind of movie that I recommend, you know, like, obviously, if you have very, very little time to watch movies, maybe, maybe just do with a summary of it. But if you have time, I, I'm very glad that I've watched it. And yeah, <laughs> don't show it to someone who's not old enough that they can appreciate it because they might be put off from watching it again. Now, let's see, so, so yeah, um, some videos I swear, this will not be one of them. That, I swear. Now, th let's see, that brings us to, 
the yeah so I have watched this I think about half a dozen times by now and the first time was in 2011 and yeah so the plot yeah, I'm going to be quoting the one from IMDb because it does a very nice job. In an oppressive future, a fireman whose duty is to destroy all books begins to question his task. And I forget if I ended up writing it in my notes anywhere. Um, in case I didn't, I will just say here that I have this is the only version I've watched of this uh, movie you know I, I am aware that others exist I really wish that the reviews were way way better for the you know there's one like they cast Michael B. Jordan like it's just I've never seen him be bad but it only has a 4.9 on IMDb so just yeah yeah and it's actually got some great cast members other than you know in addition to Michael B. Jordan it has Michael Shannon yeah I, I really really wish that it seemed like it was way better and I do think that it is the kind of thing that you can do an excellent remake of you know these days you know technology and filmmaking has developed to a point but yeah it's just not um, oh there's a thing from 2022 a, a short um, it has no rating on IMDb, so, but, but yeah, haven't, haven't watched it. I do think it would be great if they made one that, like, yeah, let's see, yeah, so, let's get into the writing. So this was written by Francois Truffaut, who also directed it, as well as Jean-Louis Richard. It was based on the Ray Bradbury novel. And additional dialogue, though, and credited were written, was, was written by David Rutkin and Helen Scott. Now, uh, there it is. Yes, so... Mm. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, one of the inspirations is definitely McCarthyism. In the West, to read has not been made illegal, but the algorithm means that we don't see other people's perspectives. American conservatives are simply not given facts that complicate their opinions. In 2022, I saw a YouTube video where a Trump supporter insisted that Trump had won the election and was currently president but that Biden was to blame for the inflation, you know, so, yeah, a lot of the things that the the book and movie warn against, you know, it isn't as bad as, you know, thankfully, but it's, it has gotten worse since the, the book and movie. Now, uh, conservatives, I've, I've seen some conservatives claim that we progressives are turning America into the society shown in the story, you know, by asking for minor adjustments in some language to express empathy for groups of people that are currently being targeted by bullies and for hate crimes, including murder, some of them bullied to the point of suicide. On the other hand, we progressives point out that conservative politicians are trying to turn America into the country we've seen the story by passing anti-LGBTQIA laws laws against critical race theory like I get that to some people this is gonna sound like just you know two two differing opinions but I do feel like we progressives have more of a leg to stand on here you know the the movie isn't just about oh you know 
certain words are not no it's it's about destroying certain ideas and pieces of expression it's not just about you're no longer allowed to say a certain offensive words just anyway According to IMDb Trivia, author Ray Bradbury never did any fact-checking in regards to the title. He asked a fire chief temperature for the temperature where book paper burned, was given the answer 451 degrees Fahrenheit. He liked the title so much, he didn't bother to see if it was the correct temperature. Actually, the chief went to burn an actual book because he didn't know the answer when Bradbury asked him. He read the temperature with a thermometer. And I have since read that apparently, like... It has nothing to do with that. It was just like, no, that, you know, there's other, there are various factors that, yes, some books burn at 451 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's not true for all books. There's some variety there, and it's in part because of, like, the conditions, but, yeah, it's a great title, you know. It's very evocative, like, the, the, um, you know, I'm not going to claim that I agree with everything Michael Moore says and does, but, you know, yeah, the fact that he used it, you know, Fahrenheit 9-11, you know, was a, a good kind of just, yeah. Let's see. Um, let's see. Yes, so, uh, Critic... Uh, yeah, some critic quotes. Naturally, the auteur Truffaut wants to be involved in all parts of the filmmaking process, no matter how unqualified he might be for any of them, so that the project will have his imprint. So naturally, he worked on the script. One tiny problem pops up there. You see, Truffaut didn't speak English. Fahrenheit 451 was his first and only and you can maybe see why. English language production, and it shows. The dialogue is something I'd expect to get after running Bradbury's story through an online translator, first into French, then back into English. You know, like like the, the I guess, a more recent, you know, this, this that, that review that I'm quoting from is, is a little, I guess today it sounds like an AI wrote so yeah he doesn't get the metaphors wrong which an online translator would do don't want to be too hard on the guy but rather removes them in favor of bland simplistic third grade writing writing is an art if you don't have the tools leave it to someone who does so that is very harsh I would not go quite that far but it is funny and I do think you know I I wish Truffaut had you know, it is that thing, like, I uh, I have a lot of admiration for, you know, auteurs in general, like, there's, there's a lot that they do that's very, very interesting and very compelling, but every so often it's like, okay, we get it, you're super excited about doing this, can you please ask someone who's better at it to at least help with it, you know, you don't have to give it up entirely, but just have someone help you with it. You know, and I do think that this movie could have been, like, completely amazing. Like, bowl over, just mind-blowing amazing. You know, there are movies from the 60s. I mean, I mean this was the same decade as, that, that Kubrick put out the, the um, t you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which also the work of an auteur and... I, you know, there's, like, there's stuff in that that maybe hasn't dated the best, but I can't really, like, there's not much negative that I have to say about that movie. Almost everything is spot on in that, you know, and I think this movie could have done that, you know. Yeah, that movie, is, you know, they're, they're about different things, but, yeah. You know, where that movie is about the 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 development of, you know, the way that human tools, we, we keep improving our tools, you know, and the, you know, the idea of space travel as this, like, next step kind of thing, and the idea of, of a logical, unfeeling machine having a lot of control over, you know, what happens to human beings, you know, the, these are very, very interesting ideas, and it does a fantastic job with them, you know, like, there's, you know, 
it's no wonder that it's inspired so much since. You know, Interstellar takes a lot from the space stuff. The Terminator takes a lot from the idea of and you know a cold AI that determines the fate of human beings. You know, comparatively, like this movie, nowhere near as as much. Like, you know. I do realize, you know, that we, I put it behind me, I think it's, is it that one? Uh, yeah, yeah. Equilibrium, you know, takes a lot of inspiration from this, for sure. But, other than that, there's not that much, you know, and, and Equilibrium is no, you know, that is not Interstellar, that is not the Terminator, you know, I I do have some issues with Interstellar, but the, you know, the space stuff itself is amazing. Let's see, and right, and yeah, one one user review said, "Look at what we have now on our own wall TV in 2020: cancel culture, fake news, forced cultural and racial diversity." Mindless babysitter programming. I agree with the, the about the mindless babysitter programming, though. So I guess this guy, you know, okay, you'd prefer we return to the forced cultural and separate racial separation and erasure genocide. You poor dear, you were born in the wrong decade. You must wish you had gotten to be a colonialist. And I think this is different, but another user review said, how do you feel about people trying to ban the adventures of Huckleberry Finn because the N-word is used in it? I feel a lot better if you had written N-word rather than writing it out with the full ER, but then I get then I get the feeling you were looking for an excuse to write it out. And let's see. But but yeah, um there's some really interesting elements to the, the writing. I the dialogue does have a lot that that is really, really strong. The the there's some excellent verbal explorations of fascism. The the you know this is this is I I love when movies like this trust the audience enough that the bad guy and it's clear it's the bad you know you you don't like nobody watches this well I guess some of those conservatives maybe did but you know people with half a brain cell. Don't watch this movie and take away, oh, I guess we should be burning books. No, you, you know, you hear the rationalizations they use, but, you know, so, so you see that, because it's important to note that people who do things like this, some of them just aren't thinking about it at all, and we do also see that in the movie, but some of the people who have a lot of power and are making this happen they have actually thought about it. Not necessarily in like, and maybe just like they, they, you know, kind of, kind of confirmation bias, like they start with the ending and work their way back. You know, they, okay, books are illegal, we have to burn them, here's why. You know, not like, some people don't like books, what should we do? You know, is it, just, so, so, yeah. Let's see. You know, like, it's conservatives who are, like, banning books from school libraries because they mention things that they don't like their kids hearing about, you know, which there is a very strong parallel to, you know, that's something that's brought up in this movie. You know, they're, first they banned the books, now they're burning the books because they contain things that some people don't like either themselves reading or other people reading and kind of thing you know but but yeah you know you hear the rationalizations and it's the kind of thing where like it doesn't take long to poke holes in what they're how they're rationalizing it but you do see how you know there is a you know i can understand why some people choose to be conservative and i'm not sure I really believe that anybody today, like, you have the internet, you know, it, I know I mentioned, you know, algorithms, but you can, you can go past those, you know, it's not, 
You're not locked out. It's just not going to show up on your feed unless you ask for it. You know, but but yeah, the the today, you know, being conservative is a choice, you know, and it's something we have to try to convince people not to be in my opinion. You know, I I maybe maybe in a while once we've readjusted the Overton window, maybe conservatism doesn't have to be a bad thing inherently, but right now it is, you know, has been since Reagan. I wish that wasn't the case. I think that, you know, diversity of opinion is extremely important, and I do enjoy debating, but just conservatives, they go so far. I, I, yeah. Anyway, the, the... But I do understand how, how, you know, choosing to be a conservative, it must be very comforting because you can rely on thought terminating, terminating cliches. You can just think, oh, that's, you know, that's a, that's a trans thing, so it must be bad. That's a, that's a conservative saying or doing that thing, so it must be good. Never mind that the trans person is just trying to live their life in a completely non-threatening way. And the conservative is the person grooming children, raping people, you know. Yeah. Anyway, you know, you can, you, you, you see how they're rationalizing it in this movie. And you appreciate not all of them are, like, completely mindless. But it's clear from the movie they have talked themselves into believing this. And now they feel like they are you know they're they're vindicated they're they're right about this so they don't have to think about things you know which i i think that analyzing you know new information is an extremely important part to me of being progressive evidently not to, to everyone i wish tyt wasn't flushing its reputation down the toilet but yeah i'm i'm with the cavernacle i cannot support uh, tyt anymore uh, because of recent uh, yeah he he just did a video uh, um the cavernacle did a video called jenk jenk you wow it's been so long since i watched i think it's jenk i i don't mean to you know i'm not trying to mispronounce it to to bully or something Jenk Uger is destroying TYT's reputation. I'm done with TYT. And, yeah. You know, and he actually, he recently he did a video where he was saying, you know, I'm still going to watch them, but it's going to be hard. And, yeah, I understand why he is now saying, no, I'm, I'm done. I don't want anything more to, yeah. And, and, yeah, instead of me just restating what he says, just watch that video. In general, his videos are excellent. That brings us to the direction. So yeah, Francois Truffaut is was it was the director, and let's see. Right. So uh, um, yeah, this features the chilling visual of book burning as a normal, even positive thing to do. We see the way regular people become more self-obsessed since they're not being asked to empathize with other people. You know, you, you see them in the, um, what's the word, on, on this bit of public transportation. I don't know exactly how to refer to it because it's like, it's not tunnel, like underground subway. It's, you know, it's, it's up in the air. Kind of thing. Anyway, but, but yeah, you know, I forget if I said, but yeah, the the I definitely want to make sure I say. So I I forget if I put it somewhere else in my notes. But I don't think there's anything wrong with public transportation. Yeah, there's problems with public transportation in America. That's not inherent to public transportation. That's because it's being run terribly. You know, I live in Denmark. I've been using public transportation, I guess, yeah, since I was very, very little. Uh, some of my family live far apart, 
so we had to take public transportation. You know, some of my oldest memories are of being on public transportation, trains, buses, boats to to travel to to family, and there's absolutely nothing inherently negative about it. Yeah, sure, sometimes you might have to deal with with passengers that are you know rude or, or something but it's not inherently negative anyway you see some of these people on the the train and they're like caressing themselves and that is one thing I hope if they make a remake I hope no one's like just full-on taking it to the next level I guess I need to watch my language since I said it's this PG but anyway yeah you know the the yes so the Yes, they are caressing themselves, and it's often, it's it's in ways that you could see, like, if they were, you know, if they had positive relationships with other people, it would be their partner. Uh, you know, one, one, there's one guy who's, like, caressing his shoulder, which can be a very, you know, comforting, reassuring thing. Uh, one, one girl kisses her own reflection in the, you know, she's sitting at the window. Uh, you know, the, these kinds of things, so... Yeah, it is, you know, yeah, that it's the, that's the kind of thing that happens when people don't empathize with others. Or, or at least that was how this guest, you know, I guess today it's more, there's actually not as much, like I think some of the, like, really, really hard right, like the conspiracy theorists and such, I'm not sure they're really, I don't think they're, like, caressing themselves, they're just diving deeper and deeper into completely absurd conspiracy theories. Now, I'm going to quote some from my old written review. This is done with a deep love of literature, and the quoting of some of it are incredible, from the original author and the director alike. To fight this free exchange of ideas is a serious step towards blind conformity and a clear indication of a fear of what is different, a level of insecurity about how one is doing things, and the movie gets this across wonderfully. Society is held to unreasonable standards. Everything is streamlined, controlled. As an example of the amount of surveillance, the police have headshots of everyone, not only those who have already been arrested for something, and can easily find the address of anyone. The people are sedated with constant television, inspiring unrealistic hopes and dreams to keep them from starting a revolution, superficiality, and actual drugs, not forced like equilibrium, or at least not as far as we know. The married couple barely relate to one another, hardly know each other. There's a strong sense of isolation helped, along, helped nicely along by the sparse cast. Let's see. And, and leads to narcissism, or everyone being famished for connection, even only a physical one, as a direct result of the denial of an intellectual life. This evokes the imagery of Nazism and the totalitarian nature of the government, and this becomes increasingly clear to the viewer as this progresses. And I think this is a good time to, to briefly say, I think that it's done in good taste, like... There is such a thing as Nazi exploitation. You know, there are movies that are just like using Nazis for shock value, and certainly that's something that um, I want to say his name is Kurt Wimmer, but I'm gonna get it real quick. Yes, writer and director of Equilibrium, who went on to make. Uh, hold on. Have it right here. Ultraviolet, you know. He has been accused of basically adding Nazis. You know, I think it was Film Brain who said if you want to make, you know, just add Nazis. And it's, you know, yeah, sometimes he does perhaps not do it very tastefully. This movie does really explore. It, it doesn't just add Nazis to say these are the bad guys. You know, it's... It's been shorthand for decades to, to make someone seem like Nazis or Soviets or that kind of thing, you know. And yes, I realize that those are two very different, you know, they're both totalitarian, but anyway. Yes, the, the 
because this does explore, you know, I, I like I mentioned, you know, they, they have an idea. They want to destroy certain things, so they make up a rational, rationalization for that. You know, the, the um, Hitler didn't invent the anti-Semitism. He, he used the anti-Semitism that was already there, but he pushed it to a new extreme because he needed an enemy. He needed something to unite the people under him. So they started making up, you know, I, I'm not going to repeat them, but, you know, there's a lot of insane anti-Semitic, you know, hateful tropes that the Nazis came up with, and it wasn't because believing those things made things better, it was because they already decided what they're going to do, so they just need something to back that up, you know, something to say to people who might question it. And that's what we see here. And right, according to IMDb trivia, Francois Truffaut reportedly said that he found science fiction films uninteresting and arbitrary. And before you judge him for that, remember, sci-fi movies could be very shallow back then. Not all of them, they, you know. And the, I guess Star Trek: The Original Series was after this, I think. But but yeah, you know, there was some really excellent. It, yeah, yeah. Star Trek, st you know, went, went on the air in 1966. You know, there was some excellent uh, sci-fi back then, but some of it was terrible. Like, you know, there was some real shock in in the 50s. Like, I love sitting down watching it, but that's I wouldn't feel that way if that was all that sci-fi was allowed to be. You know, I I completely get why, but but yeah, because of this. A friend of his told him the story of Ray Bradbury's novel, Fahrenheit 451. Immediately afterward, Truffaut wanted to make a film from the novel and subsequently spent years raising the financing. Let's see. And, yeah, and, and some, some critics say that the movie is kind of weird because the director spoke French, the cast and crew spoke English. And... You definitely do see that's a that's yeah. Now and uh, yeah, one points out Hitchcock is the main tributary, Vertigo's Reverie, Marnie's Crimson Fades, The Birds' Schoolyard Recitations. Let's see and it, yeah, one one user review says the television play that Linda watches and believes she's actually a part of, where two men blabber on for several minutes about seating and sleeping arrangements for a party. And then he's, yeah, it is undoubtedly supposed to be funny and is the only scene worth watching in the picture. So 100% disagreed on both funny and only scene worth. It's supposed to be unbearably banal and it succeeds. Like, it, you know, you're supposed to watch that and think, how are people watching, you know, and, and the answer is, of course, because they don't really think think anymore they just they just have stuff that that you know it's basic it it kind of lulls you into not not quite sleep although they do also you know there's a there's a TV in the bedroom as well you know and if you don't want to bother the other person you can plug in some some you know but the it it lulls them into a sense of complacency you know they no nobody's doing anything in in this world and, yeah, I think it was very, very necessary to make it completely clear. Like, if you watched that bit and you thought, oh, that's just like something I saw on TV the other day, that's a red flag, you know. So, yeah. And, unfortunately, there is some, you know, I, I don't really watch television anymore. But, you know, I, I guess, has it been like 10 years or so? You know, back then, some stuff on TV was that banal, you know. But, but yeah, 1966, I don't think it was quite that bad yet. But, you know, the... the yeah, it's definitely, like... The movie has some issues because of the language barrier between the, the director... And everyone else and it's actually it is fascinating that 
parts of it do really work. Like you would, you know, if if you haven't watched this and you just heard, you know, oh, they basically couldn't communicate. You know, you think, oh, so it's a complete mess, and it it actually isn't. And, and part of it is down to the immense talent of a lot of the the technical crew. And I think, yeah, I will I will get into that very soon. Now, the opening of this, you know, uh, yeah, I'm going to be quoting MDB trivia. The film's credits are spoken, not read, in keeping with the film's theme of destruction of reading material. So, so yeah, you know, the, the um, yeah, almost every single movie ever made, the credits are in text on the screen, but here, it's someone you know, saying the things that would be there. So the title, the the stars, director, writer, these kinds of things, you know. And as this is happening, there's these zoom-ins on um, cable. The, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really a TV person, but you know the 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 thing on your roof that sticks up in the air and picks up the the signal you know and in 1966 this hit a lot harder than it does today because today it's like oh so people live there you know like i'm one of the rare people who don't at all have television you know but it's yeah you know it hit harder back then but it is still like the fact that the credits are spoken rather than printed in text is very very like and and it is the movie is very consistent about this the the you know there are times where you see some of the some of the firemen in the movie teaching others you know okay so look there's a book hidden here you have to find books so you can burn them and when they do that, you know, they'll open the book and the pages are blank, you know, just in case, you know, and, and that really underlines because, like, what do you think is going to happen if it just, you know, just write, like, this is a prop for practicing finding books or something, you know, like, it's almost kind of like, why would you even, why, why is there a book full of blank pages, you know, it's... Eh, Especially as someone who cares about like conservation of of forests and such, like you you printed all those pages and they're or you know you turned all that wood into paper and it's nothing. It's just you know you don't even have to have it open. You you can just have like a block, you know. So so yeah, you know it it really shows like they've taken it to an extreme degree, and like there are times where you'll see someone sitting reading the newspaper, which you know back then very common sight. You know that is not quite you know today they would be like watching the news or you know yeah TV YouTube something but yeah and instead of you know you you know well I guess maybe some of the people watching this are too young to have seen a newspaper with their own two eyes, but normally it has like a number of, a, a lot of words on them. And what they do in this movie instead is basically, a, like, they're all pictures and there are no words there. And, you know, I want to make it clear, today it has been proven that you can do something with just pictures you know there are some comic books and graphic novels that make excellent use of just the artwork without any words but the ones in these newspapers are not that it's just nothing it's just noise basically you know you can't get anything out of this but it's what everyone has so i guess it, you know get kind of like you know in real life you know some people eat things that are kind of completely disgusting, you know, but it's what everyone else is eating, so I guess that's just how it's going to, you know, so it's, it's, I've, I really appreciate the, how 
far they go with the world building. Like this is this is a movie where they clearly put a lot of thought into. You know, and that's again like you know, if you look at a lot of sci-fi movies from around this time, a lot of them, it's just like there's one thing that's that's different. Uh, you know, like there's giant spiders or there's aliens or something. And other than that, the world is completely the same. And, you know, for some of these movies, that works really well. But I really appreciate that this, like, they sat down... The, the writers, the director, the people working for the different departments, they sat down and thought, what would this world look like? Because to them, it was completely foreign. You know, like I mentioned, sadly, some things have since come true. And it's one of those things where, like, guys, it was a warning. It wasn't a user manual, but, yeah. So, I am not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but... The ending somewhat fits what came before. I like the ending. I, I'm not sure I quite love it. And it does not rely on Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. So, yeah, the, the overall, I would say I recommend reading or listening through the original work. I do have some issues with it, which I'll get into in the second thoughts section. But it is, you know, it's it's the kind of thing where if you like one, if, if you like the book, you might like the movie. If you like the movie, you might like the book. You know, by the time I listened to the audiobook, I'd already watched this movie like four or five times. So, you know, to me personally, it didn't really, you know, I know some people who read the book first really felt that the movie was lacking. And I do think that is, like... If you're only going to do one, then, you know, that's fine. And I definitely, I love Ray Bradbury. Like, he's written some of my favorite stories, you know. And, and I'm not going to make the mistake of calling him a science fiction author because apparently he, he sometimes found that frustrating because, like, Martian Chronicles isn't actually about Mars. And this is technically the only science fiction story he actually wrote, you know. But... You know, the others were fiction, but they weren't science fiction. But, like, he wrote this amazing short story that, like... I think if I read it today, it wouldn't hit as hard. But, like, as in, you know, when, when I was a 3 edgy 5 me teenager... I really loved this story about, like, this infant that really resents having been born if it, yeah like if if you know it gets super dark so don't go there if you're not ready for that but like if that concept sounds at all appealing like i i felt that he did a really great job exploring this idea which was also something like you know yeah it's it's basically something i've i've I thought before that, I've always thought that, you know, being being born, the, the, I think if people had the choice to be born or not be born, you know, if you showed them this is what a life might look like, you know, not, not like your life specifically, but this is what life can look like, I think a lot would not be willing to, you know. Now, let's, and I guess this is a good time to say, yes, in some ways, I am anti-natalist. No, I'm not one of the crazy ones. But yeah, the, the, you know, I really, really admire Ray Bradbury's writing. I think I've read everything by him that I got my hands on, which sadly isn't a lot. The, the, I've, I've been able to read much more, uh, you know, Philip K, PKD, um, but the, yeah, you know, when I was a teenager, I read everything that was or seemed like science fiction that I could get my hands on, especially the dark stuff. But, but yeah, you know, incredibly talented writer, Ray Bradbury. So, so yeah, you know, I, like, like I said, I, I would really urge you to check out at least one of these two, 
you know, if you if you worry that liking one of them is going to make getting through the other one frustrating, you know, you can stick to just one of them. I'm not going to tell you which is like, I, th I think both do a really good job. Like, I think overall the book is probably, at the very least, more consistent. You know, it, it has strengths that the movie doesn't. And it is very much the case of like, you know, Bradbury knew exactly what he was getting at. Where with some of this movie, some of the dialogue, you know, it is, yeah, you know, the, the translation back and forth thing that I quoted. So, that brings us to the character. So, Oscar Werner plays Guy Montag. And, yeah, so, yeah, some critic quotes. After losing better choices, Truffaut cast Oscar Werner, an Austrian stage actor direct who had worked with Truffaut before, and as an auteur, such connections are more important than who is actually right for the role. As Montag, the fact that Werner had a strong accent, difficult to explain the story, did not bother Truffaut. What did was Werner's decision to create his own character, something no auteur could allow. The two fought each other through the production with Werner, playing the part his way, Truffaut cutting out anything that couldn't nominally be stuffed into his narrow view of the character. By the end, the two hated each other, and Werner purposely... Yeah, some say he purposely tried to sabotage the film. Others say he was depressed. You know, he, he was just... He was trying to make things work. You know, but yeah. Um, yeah, countering Truffaut shot scenes with doubles, both men were far more concerned with themselves than the production. Naturally, the performance that ended up on screen is a mess, lacking life and any kind of direction. And IMDb trivia, Francois Truffaut said that this was his only film in which he clashed with an actor, Oscar Werner. Truffaut asked Werner to forgo heroics and act with a level of modesty. Werner chose to play it with arrogance. Truffaut disliked the stilted performance Werner gave, insisted he played like a monkey discovering books for the first time, sniffing at them, wondering what they are. Werner argued that a science fiction film called for a robot-like performance. And, and, yeah, like the fact that... Again, you know, if you, it, that to us, from a modern perspective, it sounds absurd. Why would a science fiction film call for a robot-like performance? But it was the, the, you know, if you look at stuff from back then, you can, you can see how the, you know, where he got the idea. And yeah, it definitely hurt the final product. I think it could work if over the course of the film, the performance really changed as the character goes through changes. But it kind of doesn't, and, you know, this movie is better than Equilibrium in a lot of ways, but I would argue that one has the superior performance by the lead male, and it's not like Werner wasn't also a great actor in his time. You know, but, but yeah, like, it's, it's really too bad. I, I don't think that, like, the accent really matters, you know, it's just, like, America's a nation of immigrants. Why, why does it hurt the story for one of the major characters to have an accent just yeah anyway but the the fact that his performance yeah it just it i don't i don't have an issue with the with oscar werner himself and i really i you know i really empathize it i the fact that he was apparently like going through a depression or becoming depressed while while making it you know i i've had the great fortune to myself work on not not, not something like big nothing you've seen nothing that hit theaters or anything but i have been part of productions where we spent months and you know yeah it there is a lot of pressure you know and I did see some people, you know, end up saying, I, this is too, you know, I can't quite, I can't keep up, you know. And it's, you know, of, of course it's frustrating for the other people involved as well, but, like, people who sign on for this kind of thing are not looking to drop out of it. You know, they wouldn't be signing on if they did. If, if they had intended to just drop out, there's, you know, significantly less punishing careers if you want something that you can 
abandoned and you know some people have gotten sued over not delivering the the you know for making a movie the way that they were you know supposed to but i do think that oscar werner was incorrect about uh, some of these things and yeah i mean i i got to say what you know Sniffing at the books like a, a monkey discovery. I, I'm I feel like that might have been going too far in the other direction, but Yeah, the the end product is awkward. He is very stiff and at times it works You know that and actually yeah to, to That is there are times where the robot like performance does really work because Montag Early when we meet him, he isn't thinking, and he certainly isn't feeling. He's just repeating, you know, he's saying things that others want him to say, basically. You know, and and this, of course, you know, like, his boss loves that about him, and, and says so, you know. And his wife doesn't really care that much because she has the the people in the TV, you know, to, to yeah, but but like there's this really excellent it's it's actually it's one of the first things in the movie and it really it right there tells you okay, some of the people making this really understand what this you know, where to where to go with this, how to make this work. Basically the boss asks him and something I would quite appreciate, the, the yeah, so the, the captain, the, right, I get, actually, yeah, I just realized, I haven't actually said, Mon, Guy Montag is a fireman, which in the world of Fahrenheit 451 means he burns books, not puts out fires. And the, yeah, you know, he has, the, you know, his, his fire chief captain, fireman captain, asks him, and I really appreciate that he's he likes to refer he doesn't he doesn't talk directly to Guy Montag. He refers to him using his last name in the third person as this kind of like power move to kinda of, you know. He asks, What does Montag do on days off? To which Montag replies, I cut the grass. Which of course, you know, and this really tells you how the captain thinks. Immediately he says, what if we made that illegal? And then, you know, Montag, without missing a beat, just, you know, within moments, replies, I'd sit and watch it grow. You know, he's, he's the ideal fascist tool. He doesn't cause a fuss. And if something that is, like, by definition not causing a fuss, like, you, you cannot start a revolution with you know just by mowing your lawn trust me i've tried it failed all three times i think i need to print more posters anyway the the by definition cutting mowing your lawn is innocuous there's there's no way that can cause you know cause the the government any harm but the captain still suggests, what if it were made illegal? And Montag doesn't say, why would that become illegal? You know, like, what What do you mean? What is, to what end? Like, it, I, I, you know, I realize that he's the boss, so it's that, but, but he also doesn't, he doesn't pursue it later. He doesn't ask someone else who isn't his boss. You know, he doesn't try to debate it or anything. He just accepts, like... When someone says, what if we made illegal something that doesn't hurt anyone and that there's no reason there's no reason for it to be illegal, you know, like your first thought should be, why? Why is something being made illegal that doesn't you know hurt anyone? Let's let's try to keep laws to, to you know they should they should prevent harm and you know make sure that that yeah you know there's there's reasons but you know but yeah the captain immediately thinks ah what if i took away the one thing you like and montag answers 
you can do that. Sure. You know, is is there anything else you'd like? You know, kind kind of and and that's why the captain likes him because he's malleable because he doesn't ask questions he doesn't think for himself and and the movie just brilliantly you know does that and and yeah early on early in the movie the robot like performance actually does work because he is like a robot but later on he's supposed to be become he's supposed to be feeling more and it's just not, it doesn't completely come across in the performance. Like, it's clearly there in the writing. Like, we can tell, evidently, you know, but it's, uh, yeah. And, and you know, it's the kind of, like, there are, there are science fiction movies where the fact that our protagonist shows little emotion works, or at least doesn't really hurt. And this just isn't really one of them. You know, this is a case where just, yeah, it's, it's too bad. I wish that Werner and Truffaut could have figured it out together and, and ended up with something instead of, of, yeah, what we did end up with. Now, Marlon Brando, Paul Newman, Jean-Paul Belmondo, Charles Aznavour, Peter O'Toole, and Terrence Stamp were all considered for the role of Montag. And Montgomery Cliff, Clift supposedly also passed on the guy Montag role. And, yeah... Um, I, I'm, I will say, I don't know Jean-Paul Belmondo or Charles Aznavour. the rest of them, they would have really, yeah, hit it out the park, you know, at least if they hadn't also had the, the wrong idea, and, and again, like, I, I don't think I've seen Oscar Werner in other stuff, but he was very, you know, he and Truffaut worked together before, and people really, you know, it, I've, I've heard a lot of praise for Werner's work, you know, in the other Truffaut. So, yeah, I, it's, it's really just the, the disagreement. And, and apparently, like, it's, it's this thing of, like, he, in between making these two movies, you know, after Oscar Werner worked with Truffaut on the other one, which, I, is, is it the one called Jules et Jim? I, I, I don't remember all of his, uh, anyway, but yeah, you know, in between, you know, because for that one, he went along with what Truffaut wanted, but in, in between, he went to, like, this, you know, he, he had some, some training, some, some acting training or education to, which, which kind of made him think, you know, it kind of told him this is how good acting, this is what good acting looks like. And it just, it wasn't what Truffaut wanted, and yeah, that that was one of the, the places where they clashed. Now, Paul Newman dropped out of the Montauk role because, according to Lewis M. Allen, he wanted the film to be more political and sociological, and Truffaut refused. Yeah, I could, I could absolutely see how that could have been, been great. Yeah. Now, Julie Christie plays Linda Montag, and according to IMDb Trivia, Jane Fonda, Mia Farrow, and Florence Henderson, and some claim Tibby Hedren, or uh, Jean Seberg, you know, were, like, you know, were considered or something like that. And I do think she, Julie Christie does a great job, but I would definitely also say those other, yeah, um, I, I'm not very familiar with Florence Henderson, but for sure the, the other three, 100% could have, have, but, yeah, um, you know, Julie Christie, with her, you do really see, like, at the very start, she is, maybe not happy, but content, you know, she's, she's fine with how things are, and, you know, she's, she's smiling and, and beaming and like, and it's not like, you know, most amazing, you know, everything is amazing kind of, you know, that's not the vibe you get from her quite, but she seems to feel like things are going the way they're supposed to. And over the course of the movie, you know, some things happen that she's really not happy with, and she really does get... Of, she does a very, very good job, you know, selling that, and, yeah, you know, and, and it's also, I, I feel bad, like, she's giving Werner a lot to work with, but he's not really doing a lot, like, 
the the they almost have chemistry because certainly like you get the sense that she you know I, I don't know if I'm not sure I would say she's happy with him necessarily but she like it's agreeable you know it's you know this is my husband I am his wife that's fine you know she's she she's okay with that you know and she like she shows some interest in in you know there's the there's the you know hi honey I'm home how was your day kind of thing but she doesn't seem that invested really you know and and she does a good job that you know you get the sense that in real life she is a very charming charismatic person and she does a very good job dialing it down to where it's like you know no she's she's okay you know she's she's doing fine I, I mean Cyril Cusack plays Captain Beatty and uh, let's see yeah uh, one one critic points out when he argues why books have to be burned it sounds like he used to love them himself certainly he knows more about them than the firemen working for him and that's a really excellent uh, point and uh, right and another uh, reviewer points out I appreciate they let him make his case so we can see how bad arguments against books are which you know I, I said something similar earlier but it's yeah it's it's absolutely true and and you really do get like there is a sort of like there's almost a sort of bitterness or pettiness you know he'll he'll talk about you know oh the the philosophers they're all disagreeing with each other and you know you've you've got these fiction books those people never existed and it's it's this thing of like None of what you're saying is an argument for burning books. Like, I, it, it, like you know, if you don't want to read them personally, you know, because of that, like, it sounds like he used to love books. And then maybe something happened for him personally, or maybe it came from up above, you know. Books are banned. Gotta burn them. And it's that thing. I think the American expression is sour grapes. It's that thing of, like, if I can't have it, it's awful. It's actually no, no. I I hate it. I hate it. I never loved it, kind of thing. And and just you know, and and he actually does deliver a, a very compelling performance, and it's also there in the words. So it's really you know the the yeah the the acting and writing really are working hand in hand very nicely there. Where at other times, like Werner, at times seems like he barely really feels some of the things he says which again when he's just quoting the manual at at people that works you know there's a there's an early part where like you know someone asks him what you know what's it like being a fireman you know what's it like burning books and he literally just you know not it's not the only thing he says but one of the things he says is basically just the motto which like it, you know it's it's there's some alliteration going on there, so that's fun. But like, you know, it's it's something like you know, each of the days of the week, they burn an author that has the, that whose whose name starts with the same letter as that day of the week does. You know, it's it's this thing of like, okay, you know, that's a, that's a way to sell it, you know, but that's not like. And and it shows he's he's basically he's struggling to to have an actual conversation with the person. And and to be fair, you know, one hundred percent that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. You know, there's like for you know some people on the spectrum struggle with with conversation. Some people are just shy. But the movie makes it clear it's because he doesn't have this. He doesn't dive into worlds of you know. I don't think it has to be books. The book definitely thinks it has to be books, but you know, you should dive into something. You know, it it you should be thinking about things. You know, and and yeah, the, the but yeah he he literally you know he's like quoting the motto and and I say oh you know we we burn the books to ash and then we burn the ash and it's like I'm sorry, are you trying to sell a product here? What is this? Just have a conversation this person expressed interest in your job that's a good place to 
that's that's a conversation you know it's like she she's also like she's she's not completely sold on the idea of a fireman but she's not like coming in guns blazing like how dare you she's just like is you know why why do you do it and he legitimately seems like what do you, what do you mean why I'm supposed to have a reason for destroying art? That doesn't... I'm sorry, who are you? What is What is this? Am I a candid camera? Like, it's just, you know, and, and yeah, the, the, you know, the writing really does it, and the performance doesn't completely always quite get there. Now, let's see. Right, and, and according to IMDb trivia, for the part of the, the captain, producers considered Lawrence, Sir Lawrence Olivier, Sterling Hayden, Michael Redgrave, and Michael Redgrave before hiring Cyril, Cyril Cusack. I'm not that familiar with the other two, but Sir Lawrence Olivier, yeah, that 100% also makes sense. I don't think that it's, this is not one of those cases where I'm like, oh, I wish they had cast, because Cyril Cusack hits it out the park. Like, it is amazing. Like, you know, hypothetically, if I could travel to the part of the multiverse where this movie was made and it was Sir Lawrence Olivier, yeah, I'd like to watch it. But I don't think that this is, this is not one of those where it's like, oh, the movie would have been a million times better. You know, that I don't, you know, and, and Sir Lawrence Olivier, like, amazing. Like, I, I you know, yeah, I, a couple of couple of recommendations. His Hamlet, amazing, um, and I think it just the the performance he gives in the original 1972 Sleuth, fantastic. Just like, yeah, one of the best actors of his generation, no doubt about it. And uh, Anton Differing as Fabian, and there's a, a bit of a, like, it feels like there's a, um, there's sort of a rivalry between Fabian and Guy Montag. Jeremy Spencer as Man with the Apple, B. Duffel as Bookwoman, Gillian Lewis as Cousin Midge on TV, and yeah. Cousin Midge, very important, and and I really appreciate. Ah, I don't really want to give it away without. Yeah, I'm not. I'm gonna get into it in the in the spoiler sections, but yeah, and she really nails it. Like, there's times where she's, you know, they're they're like she's she's one of the people. She's constantly talking to all the people of the 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 world of Fahrenheit for for five one. She's frequently calming them down like saying things are fine you know but occasionally there's something serious going on and the actress really does a great job of you know and, and maybe it is also somewhat Truffaut but if she didn't speak enough French and he didn't speak enough English I'm guessing it was it was her but just yeah whoever is responsible great choices because it's never like, you know, like, you watch Tucker Carlson today, uh, you don't watch Tucker Carlson today, do you? Because he was fired for being such a douche that no one could stand to be around him, and I'm glad because he's done immeasurable damage. I, I rarely take joy in other people losing employment. You know, and I don't, like, I'm not hoping that he ends up homeless or something, but I like the idea that he doesn't have this reach that he really doesn't have enough responsibility to have. You know, he's he's encouraged a lot of hatred. But yeah, you know, when you watch Fox News, like, they're screaming, like, ah, you know, the world is on fire. Cousin Midge, you know, it, it, it was a very different time. In 66, you know, you couldn't really imagine that anybody would watch stuff like that. So it's much more like, you know, yeah, if you watch, like, movies that have news, you know, actual news, or, yeah, often staged, but, like, the way that news anchors would speak, you know, it was much more Loki, you know, and yeah, she manages to, to strike a tone 
that never gets, you know, she's not Walter Cronkite. It's not this kind of thing where everything she says is a is a really serious and intelligent and important thing for us to to ponder. You know, it's 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 lighter than that. And then other times it's so light that it's like basically entertainment. It's it's you know mind numbing kind of thing. You know, and just really really nails it. And I really appreciate this idea of the person who you know she she tells you you know it's it's the, the like she's she's giving this really banal advice. Like at one point in the movie, she's saying, "Remember." Be tolerant of your friends' friends, which is also, like, that's clearly not something they actually believe in. You know, what she's talking about is, you know, some people, like, when they drink tea, their pinky is out. What is that? Just, you know, don't start a fight with them. You know, because you don't want people to really think about, you know, you know, that kind of thing is not going to start, necessarily going to start an intellectual conversation, but, you know, like... The, the she doesn't want people to talk about things like that she uh, she doesn't want people to talk about differences because differences are the enemy of fascism fascism thrives on everyone being the 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 same so that there is no you know because the moment that one person expresses an opinion that's like divergent from the rest someone else might be like wait why aren't we doing that and suddenly you you know you might lose control you know there there's actually there's a point in this where like they they grab this guy who's like it's not even like crazy long it's just it's it's slightly long you know and they forcibly cut it short you know and and then they show it on on the news and 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 have an inner cut this shot of people laughing at it you know to to say you know it's in, it's good that the the authorities are doing this you're a laughing stock if you step out of line and just underlining that even something that mild you know a guy having long hair that's a threat that's something because that, again like you know maybe you don't think it's great and like you know but it's like it's hair what's it gonna do you know like if he's walking around with no pants on that's you know okay that's something we need to you know but like you know so so just yeah um, that is it for that. So, um, let's see. Yeah, and yeah. So the I've I've pretty much said everything that I had to say about the dialogue. Um, yeah. So in uh, IMDb quote section, there are fifty entries, and I wouldn't say they're good, but they are all interesting they're all worth reading you know if, if you watch the movie and there's something you feel like oh I didn't completely pick up you know yeah there's uh, some of the some of the best stuff is is in there and yeah this is a movie with a lot of dialogue and yeah you know I, it's the the only times where it's ever like just white noise or annoying to listen to is when it's supposed to now, you know, yeah, I, I've, um, I forget if I put it somewhere else in my notes, but one person theorized that the 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 two guys talking about seating and and sleeping, you know, they might actually be a gay couple, and that's something that they sh snuck past censors, and yeah, I think it might actually be, you know, and that's, you know, the French view on sexuality. A lot of the way much more you know much less restrictive and yeah that's great now uh, yes that brings us to the cinematography and this is just this was handled by Nicholas Rogue who after you know after being yeah he, he was cinematographer on 19 projects from as far back as 61 and holy crap 
2018. Okay, but yes, yeah, 61 to 71. And he also became a director. And he directed the excellent Don't Look Now, as well as other, like, he's unbelievably talented director. And, yeah, like, he knew exactly, like, the, the look here is phenomenal it's it's really I I don't the 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 um, yeah it's just it's it's absolutely incredible the the um, you know places are shot to be oppressive and you feel like you, characters are trapped in them which is you know an excellent visual metaphor for fascism um, right, one, 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 one critic points out, the books burning are filmed as if they were people burning, which is just a stroke of genius. It's such a clever way to do it. Because technically, if you're just looking at books burning, you know, they represent the loss of, of great art. But you know, the, the, the movie doesn't, isn't only interested in saying, Look at you know the 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 art we're losing. It's commenting on how the loss of art leads to a loss of humanity, and that is very true. You know, there's there's a lot of people today that you know they they learn how to be not from like stuff that has like intelligent, informed opinions about you know how human beings relate to one another. It's this, like, incel crap that has no idea, like, just recently the, the, um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and link it in the description box. I guess it's just a couple of days old by now, but there was a, let's see, um, oh, yeah, yeah, I will, I'll just open here and have yeah uh, there's this organized chaos video just three days ago I'm gonna I'm gonna link it in the description box so to make it easy but yeah the the yeah the video is called relationship advice from an incel and yeah like it is it is this YouTube video where a guy you know he's he's responding to a YouTube video where a guy is like trying to yeah you know, it's, it's lifestyle advice. And like, based on what he says, it's like, how did you, how did you come to these conclusions? How do you, how is this what you think is how things should be? Like, it's, it's completely, it's, it's wild. And yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's, there we go. The, the, Yeah, you know, the the fact that you know, I'm not I'm not going to go off on a thing about oh, you know, I wish people still read more books. I wish that the media we were consuming was all intelligent and deep and based on you know, what people are like and and showing like showing showing characters to be complex as people are complex in real life and yeah that's some of what we we lose with this and yeah it's 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 an inspired decision to to film it like that that brings us to the editing handled by Tom Noble and that's right yeah he is actually he is still editing today and yeah, this this was the first movie that he edited by you know, he he had worked in the editing department. Or hold on. yeah, yeah. He had worked in the editing department. This was the first time he was editing a movie by him you know, that he had the full yeah. And so I'm not gonna claim that like everything um you know he's edited Red Dawn, 
Exorcist 3, Poltergeist 2, Thelma and Louise, that's right, he did an excellent job on that one. Hudsucker Pross, also very, very nicely edited. Um, someone had to edit The Island of Dr. Moreau, yes, the 1996 one. Um, yeah, he's he's done... But, but yeah, he did a really, really great job here, and there's some really interesting decisions that he made that, like, there's this, uh, let's see, yeah, that's right, yeah, it's the first thing he edited where he was the main editor, not one of the members of the editorial department, and that maybe helps explain some of the weirdness. There's definitely some decisions where you can tell this was the first time that he, and I don't think, like, I wouldn't say they clash necessarily with Truffaut's vision. It felt more like Truffaut was like, you know, he, he maybe had a kind of weird idea and the editing just supports that, you know, some of the time. But but yeah, there's there's this part where like, you know, you start with the, the full screen and then like some black will cover like half of the screen and and... Yeah, it's there's there's some there's some interesting decisions that's that are that are made. But when it really, you know, a lot of it is just incredibly effective. And yeah, so this the the budget was 1.5 million and the box office was 1 million. So, yeah. That is not great. The, the, or the yeah the the um, U.S. Canada I mean the but but yeah let's see um, uh, that can't be right. yeah anyway and it does like you can see that they spent a lot of money on it and I get why it didn't make a ton of money it's not you know it's not quite like you know we're talking mid to late 60s like there was a lot of excellent uh, stuff in in cinemas so yeah like you know not everybody went to watch this one and a lot of the people who did see this one in theaters probably didn't watch it more than once it's just it doesn't quite work well enough and it's maybe a little too like heavy and not quite emotionally involving enough in part because of Werner, not to, I, I really don't mean to be kicking him while he's down. Now, this was filmed, yeah, some of the, 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 that's right, it's called a monorail. The monorail was filmed in Loire, in France, and it was, like, apparently real, but it, it you know, they, they removed it after filming this, but it worked while they were making it, actually. It, and yeah, otherwise, it's a lot of it is filmed in England. Some of it is actually on the yeah. There's this place called Danbury Avenue in London, which the, yeah, location shooting. They really get some great. Uh, it it really feels like this is a real place that people live. You know, some of it is just shot in studio. And that brings us to the music, which was handled by Bernard Herrmann, who also just like unbelievably talented. I love his work with with Hitchcock. Just yeah, in incredible. Now uh, let's see. And yeah, like with like his work with Hitchcock you know this is very clearly Bernard Herrmann's work he has his fingerprints on every note very dramatic really goes for the emotions no holding back and see. yeah and, and some of the music is actually free here on YouTube and it is compelling to listen to by itself also and yeah, so so it is an original score, and it works incredibly well for Hitchcock's style of gradually heightening tension and suspense that explodes into outright violence. This movie doesn't have that all that much, so it doesn't fit as well, and that is too bad. 
And let's see, and yeah, so IMDb Trivia, the first of two collaborations between Truffaut and Herman. On meeting Truffaut, the ever-suspicious Herman asked, Why do you want me to write Fahrenheit? You're a great friend of Boulay and Stockhausen and Miss Ayn. This is a film that takes place in the future. They're all avant-garde composers. Why shouldn't you ask one of them? And Truffaut replied, Oh, no, no, they'll give me music of the 20th century. You'll give me music of the 21st. Herman immediately accepted the offer. And I do also think, like, again, I it's fascinating to try to piece together exactly what it is Truffaut, how he thought the movie should be. You know, and yeah, it, it is like clearly the the you know like Truffaut wasn't just like throwing st throwing stuff at the wall seeing what sticks he had a vision and the movie isn't completely it doesn't completely work and it isn't completely his vision you know in part because of Werner and yeah it is it is very very um yeah, I have some I have some more quotes for it, but it is it is fascinating. Like I've I've seen a lot of movies where like they didn't have a they didn't have a big budget. They just needed some music, so they just got kind of filler music and it it sounds bad, they should feel bad and it doesn't work for the movie. And then there are some where it's like, you know, okay, that's actually good music, but it's used really badly like Several of the the Resident Evil movies, uh, you know, Paul W. S. Anderson, like it's fascinating. Sometimes he gets it, but other times he just has no idea how to use music in his movies, and he'll use like really like, eff like should be effective, like really really intense heavy metal, which you know makes a lot of sense for this kind of you know overpowering situation of zombies. But then it like, you know, yeah, one thing I, I thought of the, the way to phrase it a while back, uh, years ago, it kind of feels like you're watching a movie and someone is in the other room, completely removed from, from you watching the movie, playing heavy metal loudly. Like, it's not necessarily bad music, not all of it, certainly, but it really doesn't jive with what we're seeing completely you know it, it kind of feels like he just thinks i don't know people put music in movies i guess this this is it you know and just yeah and and yeah again that really is not it does not feel like that's what happened here it feels like herman had a vision it was something that Truffaut, you know yeah it was something he wanted he, he they they at least somewhat agreed on the vision and it just doesn't completely yeah but yeah so the yeah the DVD has some interviews and yeah one one points out the music is very romantic in contrast to the cold people the music is supposed to remind us of the emotion that these people are supposed to be having and you know yeah that is I like that idea. I, I wish I felt it worked better, but that is definitely, like, I think contrast in filmmaking can be extremely effective, extremely useful, you know, and just, yeah. Um, let's see, yeah, and, and some more from the interviews. A lot of the music has a childlike, childish nursery rhyme quality to it with xylophones, among many other instruments, and this is because the characters in the movie have been reduced to children, not allowed intellectual exploration. And that, again, like, very nicely done. And, and it is, like, it's, it's Baron and Herman, like, it's, let's go, let's, you know, like, you can very clearly hear the xylophone, like, a lot of people would be like, Am I really gonna put a xylophone in a movie about book burnings and like you know? I got nothing against the xylophone. It's just not really like, yeah, you know, like like you know something you might, you know, you can you can understand like some of the some of the like like brass and and like like a classic orchestral like kind of score you could you could understand, but. Yeah, this childlike stuff and the Zalva and this, yeah. 
let's see, oh, right, and the theme for the firemen is extremely repetitive because they are a hammer, a simple creation that just bludgeons away creativity. And that's the kind of thing that I, th I think they had a good idea, but ultimately, yeah, the fact that it is repetitive, I, I think we end up kind of feeling like, okay, we get it, stop, you know, more than like, oh, it's like, you know, and it's, I'm, I'm a big fan of Hans Zimmer. I think he's done some incredible work, especially with Nolan, uh, that, that also uses repetition, but he'll, he's, he does a really great job of just, just enough, like, variation. And I, I kind of wish that that, you know, yeah, honestly, I think this movie would have, you know, I'm not saying that they, like, oh, why didn't they just hire Hans Zimmer in 1966 when, let's see, he was nine years old. I'm sure he could have done a much better job than, you know, veteran Bernard Herrmann. But if they made another one and they tried to go for something similar, I think Hans Zimmer could nail it. And, yeah, so some quotes from reviews. The soundtrack is okay, but it is used to pound us over the head on occasion that this is an important scene. Since the movie is otherwise quite laid back, letting us freely decide what is important, the soundtrack can be very jarring. Very true. Another points out, the European style of the often rigid camera work clashes with the full-blown pomp of the English incidental music. And that is very, very true. You know, the... the so, so, yeah. Bernard Herrmann's score and Nicholas Rogue's cinematography, like, on their own, like, if you if you just take one, which, again, you know, I, I watched the movie with, like, uh, I want to say commentary, yeah, like, basically a commentary track, so you don't notice the music as much, and you just look at the photography, and like I said, I listened to the music on here on YouTube without watching the movie at the same time, and they work incredibly well separately. But the moment that you put them together, they just they they clash. It does not, and and it's it's too bad. I I wish that the yeah, but again, it's an it's an interesting failure. It's not a it's not a boring failure, and I wouldn't say that the movie is like exhausting to watch. Like I I fear that I'm maybe making it sound a little because like music and photography that you know those can be very exhausting if they're not exactly right but no I I've thoroughly enjoyed all six of my viewings there's some excellent sound design I uh, let's see I guess so, honestly some of this might not have been like Foley it might have been just that they got this audio on and just decided to keep it but some of the time, like the books, like they'll they'll hit each other, they'll hit the floor, this kind of thing, and just I don't know, just something about it, just it really, it it just it works. It makes them feel more important, you know. Because like I I get you know some people might think of you know, books, it's just I, I mean it's it's paper, who cares, you know? But here it's extremely important. And, yeah, the pacing is also somewhat, like, I wouldn't say that it's ever boring, but it definitely is a movie that, like, some parts move very fast, others move kind of slow, and I don't think it completely works. Now, the movie is one hour and 48 minutes long, and this is how long it is, whether you count the, the end credits or not, because the end credits are basically just the end. You know, this was back when credits were all at the start. And I do think that really works. Uh, th actually, hold on. Uh, yes, because the fact that it opens, you know, immediately you're put in the mindset of, oh, this is a world of no text, basically, you know. So the fact that, yeah, it would have felt very awkward if at the end there was either a bunch of normal text credit, end credits, or a bunch, or, or a guy just saying, you know, yeah, saying 
the movie title, the 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 cast and crew names and such, you know. So that that is the thing that I definitely I th I think if they make one. I think it might make sense to do, you know, like, today we're seeing movies that just forego opening credits, you know, like, at the very end, the title will flash up, and then you get the full end credits. I think that could work for a remake of this. Uh, although, I, to be fair, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't stand out quite as much, because today there's a bunch of movies that do that. Now, that brings us to yeah the the um, the best elements of this is how interesting it is even though not everything works the parts that work really work how well it shows fascism at work so we can avoid it like it really you get a very good sense you know they do the obvious thing of you know oh you're going to code characters as nazis well got to have them dress in this kind of non you know they they're they're dressed the firemen are dressed in black, and it's not like, you know, it's not like a, a cool black, like, leather jacket kind of thing. It's it's this very, like, they look like government workers without identity, without identities of their own, basically. Like, they look, you know, it, the, the clothes, it's, it's like they're not really people... It's like it's like how you'll you'll sometimes like if you when you have your tools you might put them in a in a specific you know whether whether you like hang them on the wall or put them in a in a box like you have a specific place you put your tools because they're your tools you know they feel like the tools of the government not people who happen to work for the government which you know like ideally you'd you'd want someone who works for you know I'm not saying that we can have a society with absolutely no, I think we definitely need to reform the police, but like, yeah, like ideally you'd want to be able to, to have a personality, have an identity, you know, it's not, not something that interferes with your work, but anyway. So yeah, the worst aspect are some, some of the special effects, and it wants to comment on relationships with people, and because when it was made, positive relationships between people was seen more of a feminine than masculine thing, it ends up criticizing women more than men and being sexist and misogynist in that way. And gender flipping the whole movie would improve this aspect. I forget, did I think about it? Yeah, the, the, um, let's see. Yeah, briefly on the special effects. I realize I, I accidentally skipped that before. For yeah, actually, just very briefly, there's not a lot of stunt work. There is some that's okay. It's not like amazing. The special effects, you know, there's not like a lot of like futuristic or you know, it's not a very special effects heavy movie. Uh, you know, the it it does show technology that did not exist at the time, but does now. But it is. There's a there's just a couple of shots that are really not good special effects and and I don't know why like it almost feels like someone just threw their hands in the air and said I don't I don't care just do it you know like someone said we have to have that shot in the movie and someone else was like oh no we do okay fine we'll put it in there but it's going to suck and it's it would be so easy to edit it out and it's it's just it's 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 fascinatingly terrible i i i'm not ho trying to hold it to standards that it couldn't meet you know but they could have done a much much better job and they could have easily just removed it uh, you know it's it's really not very futuristic it's mostly just like variations on what we have so you know, they have a fire truck, and instead of putting out fires, they, you know, they have flamethrowers and they burn books. So, you know, that's a that's a, you know, it's a it's a subversion of what we know from our own world, but it's not like this big futuristic. You know, I'm really glad that they didn't say, oh, we should have like a robot that fires a flamethrower because it wouldn't have, they wouldn't have been able to do that, to to make you know, and and make it convincing. Now, um, let's see, 
But yeah, ultimately, I don't think this is a huge problem for the the movie. It is just, you know, it, it frustrates me. And, and the, the sexism and misogyny is a lot worse than the book. Anyway, something I saw some others criticize was the acting of Julie Christie. I don't really agree. I, I thought she did a really, really good job. Now, uh, let's see. So yeah, the thing I was most worried about was that it would be kind of a mess from... You know the the production, the the situation with a, a director who only spoke French and a cast and crew who mostly spoke English. Like there was a little bit. I think I think maybe the editor could converse with with Truffaut, or was there like a go between? It's been a while since I watched the the DVD stuff where they talk about it. But yeah, you know the the movie. Like I said, it's an interesting. It's fascinating to watch. It's not a complete success. And yeah, the thing I was most looking forward to was uh, Truffaut, and yeah, like he's not boring. It's it's not completely successful, but it's definitely not boring. Now the trailers that I found definitely do give at least a little bit too much away. I I'm not sure how you get audience interest without spoiling anything, but uh, let's see the, the yeah the the modern. The modern trailer is worth watching, and also, like, yeah, I don't, actually, I'm not sure any of the trailers do that great of a job of giving you an idea of what the movie is like, but that was, that was a thing at the time, you know, it was the style at the time. The cover and poster do not give too much away, and they're fine, you know, not, like, amazing, but, yeah. There's not really anything else to say about that now. Right, this, um, yeah, when I searched on YouTube, I found six clips, three trailers, including fan ones, 20 review analysis, some of them of the original book, comparisons between the two and such, three joke pop culture ones, and that's it. Now, on, I, uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it has an 81% on the tomato meter, which is very impressive for considering that a lot of people think that there's a lot about it that doesn't work. And like I said, I agree with a lot of that. Um, but yeah, 81 based on 36 reviews, only 7 of them rotten. 72% audience score based on more than 25,000 ratings, which I gotta say, I, I was very delighted to see that it was so positively... Because Rotten Tomatoes, like, the, the audience score can sometimes just be, like, they really tear into something that's like, you know, it's fine. It's not the worst thing ever, but they're kind of acting like it is because it doesn't, anyway, but yeah. Because it's not what they're used to often. Um, but yeah, the consensus Fahrenheit 451 is an intriguing film that suffuses Truffaut's trademark wit and black humor with the intelligence and morality of Ray Bradbury's novel. And the average critic rating was 7.40 out of 10, and the average user rating was 3.7 out of 5. So that is only just barely, you know, anything 3.5 and above that is like an, an up, you know, it's, it's Rotten, Tom, Rotten Tomatoes is binary, you know, it's either, it's either up or down, there's no meh, I thought it was okay kind of thing, it's, you know, 3.5 anything above is, is up, so yeah, more than 72, uh, yeah, 72% of more than 25,000 people gave it over 3.5, and many of them gave it 3.7, so Barely good by the Rotten Tomato standards. But yeah, so it is fresh. And it's not on Metacritic at all, which, I, yeah. Sometimes I really don't understand why, how some stuff is on Metacritic and other isn't. Now, on IMDb, there are 216 user reviews, or 149 if you hide the spoilers, and yeah, I read all uh, 216 of them, and the top 100, the, the 100 voted most useful, 
3 gave it 1 out of 10, 1 gave it 2 out of 10, 5 gave it 3 out of 10, 4 gave it 4, 2 gave it 5, 11 gave it 6, 21 gave it 7, 22 gave it 8, 6 gave it 9, and 16 gave it 10. So yeah, more positive than negative, but some negative. And on the IMDb External Reviews section, 38 of the 73 links worked and were in English. It did not win any awards, but it was nominated for four. Uh, let's see. So, um, let's see. Yeah, so it was nominated for Hugo Awards. Best Dramatic Presentation. Truffaut for Screenplay and Director, Jean-Louis Richard for Screenplay, Helen Scott for Screenplay, Rip Ranbury based on the novel. Let's see, and it was nominated for a Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival. Love Truffaut, and let's see, yeah. Now, that brings us, oh right, I put the effect, so I didn't accidentally skip it, I just forgot that I moved it to here. Anyway, so yeah, um, the movie is not like very visually violent. Um, there's implied violence, but it tends to be off screen. And like, yeah, you know, hypothetically, if like you're watching the movie and one of your kids walks in, like a lot of them are not going to pick up. Like, there's, there's, like, one or two, like, very specific where they say, oh, someone died like that. But by and large, like, considering that this is essentially about Nazis, it's very nonviolent, you know. And, yeah. And that is also something where, like, I think in some ways, I, at least for a modern audience, I would say that equilibrium hits harder because the violence, you know, with the with the bone breaking and the the very brutal elements of it, you know, and that movie is definitely like for adults. But but yeah, you know, the the it's the kind of thing. There we go. Um, yeah, I think that one for for modern audiences works better. You know, I'm you gotta remember even like Bond movies from from this time were not particularly violent. You know, when some of the more recent ones can get very violent. Now, yes. So the the DVD this the the following does not apply to every version. You know, if you're buying it, make sure you read. But the version I have has 11 and a half minutes behind the scenes where they talk about the novel. Ray Bradbury explaining where the ideas and names came from. Uh, there's a 44 and a half minute general behind the scenes uh, about the movie. One that's 6 and a half minutes. That's all about the music. And let's see. So, so yeah, you know, in total, one hour and 12 and a half minutes of behind the scenes stuff and it's very informational you learn about a lot about how they made the movie there's a feature commentary track featuring some cast some crew very interesting worth the time spent uh, let's see and you know I, I will say like if you're looking at like okay you know you can get a bare bones that's very cheap and one that has all the stuff that I just mentioned, but it's, like, much more expensive, I wouldn't say it's quite worth that. But, like, you know, if you really want to learn more about how they made the movie, how it ended up like this, you know, it's worth the time, at least. And I, I saw one reviewer, and I'm, I don't think this was even, like, a user review. I think this was someone who had, like, their own page where they post reviews. One guy said, I was really bored with the commentary track by Julie Christie, so I stopped watching it. Seriously? You must have given it about half a minute, because around that time, and I'm not I'm not exaggerating, around half a minute in, it goes to a different commentary person. You'd know it wasn't only her on there, which he expressed surprise when someone pointed out to him in a comment on his review. Besides which, what she said at the start was interesting. Holy crap, this guy must really hate listening to women. 
and yes so that brings us to the rating so yeah um, ultimately it is seven explorations of fascism out of ten I wish I could give it an eight or a nine and I do think that it is still like you can still sit down and watch this today like you know there's movies that I would really only recommend some like, like to be clear if you're used to movies from today, don't make this like the first. You know, work your way up to it. Watch some amazing cinema from, you know, yeah. So, but but yeah, I I think if you are watching, you know, cla classic cinema, if you're comfortable with the pacing and cinematography and such, I think this is worth watching also. But yeah. It is definitely the kind of thing that, you know, I, I think I think a remake could do wonders. I, I It's too bad that the 2018 one apparently is not the, the, the masterpiece that the material could easily lead to. I, I could see, I, I don't think Nolan is interested, but I think he could really nail this kind of thing. You know, the, the um, you know, wordy dialogue, explaining, discussing, you know, concepts and beliefs, and this thing of, like, a, a dark world with maybe a little bit of hope. I, I think he could absolutely nail it. I don't think he's super interested. And it is also, like, I, I don't... I'm not sure if he feels he has more to say about like the the this kind of thing of failing governmental power leading to to people taking extreme actions after the Dark Knight trilogy and I I I totally understand why you know because it isn't like he hasn't done a ton of that kind of thing outside of the the Dark Knight trilogy you know but yeah, I, I think he could absolutely do it, and it's, yeah, we probably won't see it, which is, which is too bad, but I, I totally get, like, he's, you know, he doesn't have forever, he has to work on the stuff he really is passionate about, and, you know, usually I love his work, so, that is it for the entire review, so from here on out, there are spoilers, and, yeah, so the so yeah, some of the the following is gonna be like riffs and and jokes, and other than that, it's like stuff that I wanted to comment on that has spoilers. But yeah, starting with the first spoiler section, notes taken while watching, and. Yeah, so I, I quite like that, you know, we, we open, you know, we know from right away that there's something off here, but we see, you know, firefighters, and it's like, they're going to go save some people, they're going to go put out a fire, and it's like, nope, and, you know, the searching a house, very, you know, yeah, very Nazi, very totalitarian, and I, I kind of love the dreamlike reverse shot where he puts on the the flamethrower, you know, with help from where, where guy guy does that with help from the others, and it is like originally that was they they were hoping to get like a natural shot of that, but they couldn't quite get it in in one movement, and then the I, I forget I, I they said it in one of the DVD special features, but. Either it was Truffaut or it was the editor. They realized, well, wait, if we reverse the footage, and it's fascinating because they actually do use the exact same shot. It's not, you know, they don't play it out in, in one. They, they cut in between, but they, yeah, they have that, they play the shot both in forwards and reverse. And just, yeah, it's, it's, it's dreamlike, and I, I really appreciate the, yeah. And, yeah, I, I really like that when we first meet Clarice, and yes, it was intentional that I did not say in the review itself, that Julie Christie plays both Linda Montag and Clarice. I think, 
the first time I watched it, I didn't actually know until watching un until I was completely done watching. I like I felt like there's something there, you know. But yeah, I'm I'm really I I think it was the the I'll I'll talk more about the, that decision in the next uh, section. But yeah, you know, two of the extras are like caressing themselves, and then we see Clarice, and she isn't. You know, she's the first, like, you know, if, like, the fact that Montag isn't doing it, you know, like, we already know that he's practically a robot. You know, this is right after he said, you know, if I, when I, when I, when I'm at home, I cut the grass. If you make cutting the grass illegal, I'm going to watch it grow and I'll be happy with that. You know, so, yeah, he's, he's completely he's abandoned. The, yeah. And... You know, she she asks two questions that he really, you know, that that they're like a spot a spark for him. Do you ever read the books you burn? Are you happy? You know, and and that is you know, it's it is important to to wonder if one is happy with what you are doing, especially if you feel that you can change. You know, sadly, not everybody has the ability to, to get out of something that but you know if you if you can choose between multiple different for example jobs uh, yeah and uh, you know we yeah she uh, he guy montag goes home and then his wife in you know we hear that oh she's watching self defense you know and it's this great thing because it's like that's actually very smart you want to be good at self-defense just in case, you know. But then the camera reveals she's passively watching. She isn't trying to, to mimic it, which would be, you know, that, that would be a great thing to do. You know, it's, it's just, it's great shorthand for this is, you know, because, like, there's a lot of TV that if you're watching it passively, you know, whatever, it's TV, but, like, if you're watching, because it's not like it's not a movie that's showing self-defense. It's literally instruction. No, they even, I, I think it might be cousin Midge even, you know. And she's like, "Let's see that again," you know. So like, it's right there. Like you can, you know, you can try to do it as they do it. You can even try to do it multiple times as they show it. But no, she's just passively, you know, on the on the couch watching. And, yeah, I really appreciate that news, reality television, and ads are the same host. They have the same level of authority and the, the you know, same level of importance. They're, they're believed on the same, you know, like, because Linda is as excited about the play that's completely meaningless as... She is about, like, other stuff Midge said. You know, clearly she likes Midge. You know, Guy doesn't, but she she does, and yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and, and you know, the... Let's see. When, yeah, when they go to bed, she's still watching TV, and now it's this beauty procedure thing. So, you know, just completely... Just, there's no... It's not making you think at all. And I do want to make it clear, I don't think that there's something inherently wrong with women pursuing that. I think, you know, it's not for me to say. I'm I'm a cis man. I've never, I never, you know, I've never lived as a woman, cis or trans. I've never felt the the pressure that women feel to to look good, which is how I can live with myself despite looking like that. Nah, I'm just kidding. I feel perfectly fine about my appearance. Anyway, the the yeah. I I've never been exposed to that pressure, so I'm not judging people who uh, you know some some people spend their entire lives with you know facing that kind of pressure. I'm I'm just pointing out that you know it's not on the same level as something that really makes you think. You know, like, yeah, like, let's say, you know, if, if you wanted, like, the guy version, it would be, like, let's see, maybe the, like a, like a, 
a dumb chase scene or a big explosion or something from you know some something that doesn't make you think is is what I'm saying. And let's see. Uh, yeah, and the the play is you know low effort, no effort, high reward. You know, which is how you. That's how you get the the. You know, that's how you keep people, on you know, not not questioning, not criticizing. You know, the the. As a quick. You know, hypothetically, let's say that the thing that they were doing, that made the the to to make the citizens happy. Let's say it was like, think of a person that you really respect. Think of something they've done or said that you really admire. And think about why that is, you know, do you feel that you are living up to their example? That kind of thing, you know, that makes you think that's the kind of thing that could, you know, what if one of them really admires some kind of protest action? What if one of them says, you know, I mean, my grandfather knew, you know, he was used to pe he was used to things being much more like, yeah, what's the word, like, um, he was he was used to having much much better civil rights, for example, you know, oops, that's not, you know, the government isn't a fan of that. Now, let's see. Yeah, and you know she's she's unconscious, and he's he's you know trying to figure out you know what what do I do? Calls you know. I I don't I don't know. It just the the pills have a have a color and a number. I'm Sarah Goldfarb. I'm not Albert Einstein. And you know the the they show up. Don't worry, we're going to replace her blood. We brought some red paint just for visual effect. And it, it really is horrifying, like, how freaking pale she is. Like, she really does look like a corpse, basically. Oh, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. Please don't do that again. Last time I got in serious trouble for it. And... Let's see... Yeah, and I really appreciate that, you know, Montag uses the light of the television to read by. You know, it's it's basically either or. Earlier, we saw TVs hiding books, you know. And I, I don't think it has to be. I, I, back when I did watch TV, I also read books, you know. But the book definitely doesn't think that you can do both. And... Yeah, I really love the the first time he reads. Like the the fact that he reads every word, even the stuff that like when you when you're used to reading books, it's like okay, I get it. You know, published by so and so, whatever. Let's get to the you know. But he reads every, and some of the words he reads aloud, like he doesn't at first he doesn't even know the words simultaneously. He's like struggling through it, like you know, like like maybe a first grader or something. You know, someone who's not used to reading, maybe hasn't read before. And, yeah, the, like, he puts emphasis on the wrong parts of the syllables some of the time when reading this first time. You know, he does much better later when reading the sad book to the, the um, Linda and her friends, you know, about the, the man and, and his wife, Dora. Never knew Dora the Explorer had such a tragic ending. And, yeah, you know, we see at the park... People just accept the their stuff being searched, and let's see. Yeah, and we see Clarice and the book lady following Montag, and unlike the Nazi stuff, it isn't made to be creepy, you know. And. 
Yeah, and, and we learned that uh, Clarice was fired, and she wasn't even told why. And obviously it's because she's subversive. And the thing is, if they told her exactly why, you know, I feel it's prob it's not quite enough that they can arrest her for it, but if they tell her, you're doing this, this, and this, and we don't like that, then she's like, she might not say it to them, but she's like, why? Why don't you like that? What's wrong with that? And, you know, the I, f I forget who said it, but there's this great quote about, like, you learn a lot about society by looking at the things that are legal and what things are illegal. You know, marital rape used to be legal, but homosexuality, that was illegal until fairly recently. You know, despite the fact that marital rape literally violates consent, and, you know, for a long time that wasn't respected at all, and homosexuality doesn't necessarily violate consent. And obviously, if it does, then it's wrong, but not because it's gay, because it's violating consent. And... I like the, you know, Guy and Clarice, like, looking at the, the informer, informant, and like, ah, come on, do it, ah, do it, ah, don't check it out, you know, that's, yeah. And it's, it's great, because it's like, oh, okay, so when people go up to that, they are informing on someone, and then later, we see Linda do it, and it's not funny at all, it's, it's this tragic, like, she legitimately can't, you know, like, Guy would be happy for her to be part of it, but she just can't. You know, and, and despite the fact that she does, you know, early on, she seems to, she's at least okay with him being her husband. She, you know, she doesn't quite know him or, or you know, but she's not like, don't even talk to me or, or something, you know, which, like, you could understand if they don't really know each other that, you know, she puts a puts in some effort considering that they barely know each other as we as we learn but she can't it's it's a bridge too far and yeah and they they go to the school to see the and and you know Robert runs and his acting is so bad that Clarice just can't stop crying which you can really understand and I, I, I feel so bad for child actors because it's just like I uh, what is you doing? Just like, just have an adult character walk up and say, the children don't want to see you. I told one of them that you were there and he started crying. Leave now. You know, that, there you go, you know, but no, you have to have it like, I, I would love to know what Robert is supposed to be thinking because he walks for like a minute in the direction of, and she's, she's right there, she's well lit, you can clearly recognize her, and like suddenly he's like, <gasps> you know, and runs off, and then does it again, and it's like, what were you, ex were you expecting a different result from like walking down the same hallway, like just, yeah, not staged particularly well. Let's see, and then... <laughs> Montag has read all of his books, apparently. He is now even reading the dictionary. And he got all the way to Rhinoceros. So, yeah, that's that's dedication to reading books. Like, holy crap. I, I don't think I've ever been so disinterested in anything other than books that I read the dictionary all the way up to the letter R. Like, think about how many words he's passed to get there. Just, holy crap. Is he... Is he Reuben from the first Road Trip movie in Another Life, maybe? Because he also reads the dictionary, apparently. These books are alive. These books were alive. They, they spoke to me. Have you watched The Page Master? And... Let's see. Yeah, and the you know the TV host, the Midge claims to be in favor of acceptance, and then transitions into an ad for a beauty product. And I mean, you know, I I joked about it before, but the book is legitimately sad. You can understand why 
you know, it brings one of the, the women to te to Doris to tears, you know, and it is this thing of like, and, and that's also where like the, the women do. Yeah. I think every, every female character uh, actually does a really good acting performance. And the, yeah, the friends, like, you know, you have the one who's like, ah, my husband, I, he's, I'm, he's training or, uh, you know, and, and guys like he's at, we're at war, you know, maybe he's at the war, it's, you know, I can't talk to him anyway, why would I think about, it? you know, it's, it's a great, because that's the rationalization, you know, because like, think about it, imagine if the person you loved more than anyone might die any second, like, you'd be like, oh my god, are they okay, you know, even if you couldn't contact them, you wouldn't be like, I can't contact them anyway, like, you know, that's, that's not, you know, and, and just, yeah, the, the various ones, and the one who cries, and afterwards she says, you know, I forgot what it was like, all those feelings, you know, it's, it's a great line, and it's well delivered, and just, yeah. Let's see, and, yeah, you know, it's, it, Guy has the, the nightmare, seeing, you know, instead of Book Lady, it's actually... Uh, I can't believe I'm playing on her name. Uh, Clarice is actually Cl Clarice who drops the match and then does the Neo lean back as best she can. And it, it is, I, I mean, I understand why he's tossing and turning. It is scary how silly that looks. And, yeah, you know, he goes to the house that Book Lady was at and finds, you know, all the, all the windows and doors have been boarded up, you know, across, and it's like, yeah, this is where people's exes are condemned to live. And I love, you know, when, when Guy, you know, he's, he's trying to figure out, was, you know, was Clarice arrested, you know, and he, he goes in, and when he says, you know, oh, so they were, they were living at that house, and the captain assumes, you want their house. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, you work this job, you know, it's sure, you know, it's, it's, it's corruption. It, you know, he, they're using their power and their access for their own benefit. You know, it's not like, I know someone who needs a house. No, no, no it's, I'd like their house, you know, it, cause, cause like, I'm not saying that like, you know, if no one lives there right now, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it has to stay they empty forever, but the captain knows that Montag has a house, he know, you know, he has a lawn, they talked about it earlier, so the captain doesn't think that, oh, are you, are you, you know, are you currently unhoused? Sure, you can, you can have the house, you won't have to worry about having a roof over you, no, it's just like, you want their house? Sure, that's fine. And I like when, when, you know, Clarice and I'm gonna get the names in front of me right now so that I'm not struggling to find there we go so yeah Clarice and and Guy are you know looking for, for this thing and you know he says it was my job not is but was and you know finally she tells him the, the full truth that she and book lady you know followed him and there's the book people to go to and this whole thing. Let's see. And yeah, you know, guy tries to quit, uh, you know, take this job and hire someone else, uh, you know, and and the captain is like one more job, you know. For old time's sake, one more, you know, I'm I hate to pull you out of retirement, but I knew you could pull one last job, you know, and and Guy says, this is my house. And I love the cut to, like, I, I guess it's, like, Fabian. And he's, like, so pleased with himself. He's just, this is amazing. Just, like, yeah. And, yeah, you know, obviously, um, Guy feels great catharsis from burning the house. And, uh, you know, yeah, we see the, the captain doesn't really, you know, he says the way, you know, the only way for us to function is for all of us to be the same, but he clearly does believe that some are better than others. 
you know, the the you know, he's he's just using that to explain why books are not allowed. He does he thinks that guy is excellent, and there's that other guy that he's like, you, I should give you a medal, and the guy's like, you you did, you know, they're they're so interchangeable that he doesn't even remember that. And yeah, you know, it, I'm. I don't know how it is that, you know, I, I just, I don't know, I guess they didn't do that so much back then, but I think the stuff where, the, the footage where the the gun is being, you know, pulled and, and like, what's it called, um, loaded, or cocked, whatever, you know, I, you know, maybe it should have been like in slow motion or something, it just feels like, why does he get out the gun and then still wait until Guy has, like, lit him on fire. Like, just, yeah, it, it just feels kind of awkward. And, yeah, we, you know, the we see all the houses look exactly the same. And, yeah, I do have some more stuff to say about the book people, but it's in the next section. And, yeah, you know, the, the old guy dies as the snow falls, just like the book. And that brings us to the final section entitled Notes Taken Before Watching. And let's see. Yes, I, I really love the way that, you know, like Montag, when talking to. Clarice. When talking to Clarice, Montag, like, you know, the, the, yeah, she asks, is it true fire trucks used to be for putting out fi house fires rather than burning books? And, you know, he's like, you are crazy, you know, instead of just like, like, even if you, if you think, like, just calmly, you know, but yeah, he says, that's ridiculous. All houses are fireproof no need for putting out fires. She points out she knows a house that isn't, and instead of admitting that logically not all houses, you know, yeah, logically it follows that not all houses are the... Uh, hold on, I'll just text back real quick. You know, the, the, right, there we go. The, the, um, let's see, the, the fact that, yeah, you know, he, she's pointing out a fact that pokes a hole in the logic that he has, and instead of admitting that, he pivots, you know, he moves the goalpost. And that's what fascists have to do, because if they're not in control of the conversation, they can't win, because they don't have good arguments. You know, that's why they always use violence to take power and maintain power. Democracy does not need to use violence. Real quick... There we go. But yeah, you know, the, yeah, he pivots and says, oh, well, the hor the, the house, the horse, the horse that isn't fireproof, we're gonna, we're gonna tear that down because it's not enough in fascism for things to be perfect now. They must always have been that way. The, if they're not, if they were ever different from the way that they are now, that means hypothetically things could go back to the way they were and Maybe someone would like for things to go back to where they, the way they were. Or if not, if things used to be one way, now there's a second way. It stands to reason there's a third possible way. 
to do things. Maybe some people would want that. Fascism avoids addressing the needs of the people that they don't want to for ideological reasons, in part by shutting down debate, by simply saying things have always been this way. There is no alternative. It does this because fascism knows it doesn't have the argument. It, it has the power. Power is a slippery thing. If people realize that the power is being used wrong, which if it isn't meeting the people's needs, obviously it is. Now, let's see, right, I saw a YouTube comment point out the normalized drug use in the movie isn't talked about enough when the movie is discussed. I agree. So, part of the idea is, you know, books are made illegal, something else has to deal with people's emotions, taking drugs against your emotions, and workmen, not doctors, dealing with the occasional overdose becomes commonplace. Note that after the detox, Linda practically becomes a completely different person. Certainly, her mood is completely different. You know, she has a, a hunger. She's, like, she's vivacious. You know, she's, there's, not, like, you know, she gets romantic with Guy, which, like, who knows how long that's been since the last. There's, neither of them seem particularly interested in that. You know, they, they sleep in the same bed, but, like, they don't, they're not talking about the, like, they're, they're talking about the same subject, but they have completely different opinions on, you know, so, so, yeah. I've long believed that we are defined both as individuals and our group role by our interpersonal relationships, and I believe this movie shares that view. It presents a world where people don't have real personal relationships with other people. We see this, for example, when the wives discuss things. They don't even know what's going on with their husbands. It's useful for fascism that we don't pay too close attention to the things that could go very wrong, such as war. They only want us to pay attention when it's going well. You know, Trump very much a fascist, literally, like, he, he gave the whole game away in, in a, you know, in one statement where he literally said about, you know, I think it was a, a reporter or some, you know, someone pretending to be a reporter, I, I forget if they, no, I don't think they were conservative, so they were an actual reporter, but the, yeah, they, you know, he was asked, do you, you know, how much credit do you think you deserve? Uh, some, something like that. And he said, if it works, I deserve full credit. If it fails, I don't deserve any blame. You know, and that's, yeah, that's one way to sum up fascism. Let's see. Again, like, you know, we should always want people to be held accountable. You know, and yeah, if we pay close attention when it's going badly, we might want them to stop the war. They don't want that. But if there are interpersonal relationships without personal relationships, what are we left with? Impersonal relationships. And that's what we see with the interactive television. The people on TV have absolutely no interest in who Linda actually is. She's asked a banal question, regardless of the answer, treated like she did an incredible job. But it makes her feel like there are important people that know her and care about her. Note how upset she gets when Guy points out there's plenty of people around the country named Linda. It wasn't specifically about her. In real life, think voting on reality show contestants, something that gets more individuals participating than American political elections. Now, in the book, it all ends with the city being bombed and the book people remaking society in their image. I personally prefer the ambiguity of the film's ending. Let's see, right, and and the the thing with, you know, some, some people really dislike that the movie really, like, there's, like, one mention of the war, you know, and, like, in the book, there's this basically... You know, it's brought up several times, there's this threat of bombings, and it's, you know, it works well in the novel, I think, but I, the, the, I think the movie is better for not having them. Montag wanted to remind Linda's friends what it feels like to feel, and one of them does cry when he reads the book because it's so real written. Of course, if you want someone to cry at a book because of how badly written it is, you can't go wrong with Ayn Rand. Right, and IMDb Trivia points out most of the books being burned are classics, with the exception of a crossword puzzle book and issues of Mad Magazine and Cashiers de Cinema, which I appreciate. Now, in the book, uh, right, the the... Yeah, 
the film doesn't have the speeding cars. It does feel weird in the book, like Bradbury was just including anything that bothered him, and some of it really makes him sound like an old man yelling at clouds at kids to get off his lawn. You know, why would fascism lead to an epidemic of speeding cars? You can't read, but you can drive as fast as you want. Like, just, yeah, I that, that really felt... Yeah, but, but, you know, to an extent, like, the, the, the fear of, of TV as, you know, maybe replacing books was also blown out of proportion. I, I think it works better as a commentary on fascism than on television, you know. It's true that some television is much lesser than some books, but some books are not that, I mean, like, he's acting like, a book, well, that means it has to be, like, Dickens or Philip K or Ray Bradbury or something, you know, but there, there's, there are books that are terrible, and there's TV that's amazing. Like, we're living in an age of incredible streaming. You know, I, I just recently finished watching The Clearing, just um, amazing. You know, there's, there's depth in that that, you know, I've read my share of books. I've read some books that did not have that as much depth as that. Now, the reason The Mechanical Hound is not in the movie is that the director felt it would have people comparing the movie to science fiction movies of the time and distract from the simple story he wanted to tell. And it is also worth noting, like, the, the, the special effects would not have... Like, they, wouldn't, they would not have been able to do a, a particularly convincing job. Now, on the commentary track, Julie Christie points out that um, the reason that the two boys, possible best friends, are not allowed to sit together is because they might talk. This society wants to avoid any communication that isn't under the control of the fascist state. She compares, have you ever read a book before burning it, to moral crusaders against horror, porn, etc., who also haven't watched, read the stuff they want to See, like, you really... If you actually listen to what she says on the commentary track, she's she has interesting things to say. Like that's something that you wouldn't necessarily think of from just watching the movie, but it's absolutely true. It's a really great point. Now and and yeah, the, you know, it's the two boys in the in the class, the the two firemen students. And you know, some people think maybe they're they're actually gay, which again. Who cares? You know, why would the fascist state be against that? Because it isn't something that they're controlling, you know. I really appreciate that Linda does not immediately inform on her husband after finding the books. It would feel very petty and hostile to write the character like that. And, right, the, the editor really loved cutting in pauses, making her seem disturbed, not normal, for the neighbor woman, using the parts where Oscar was talking, cutting the audio, and he did a really good job. Like, it is, like, there's, some, there's something off about her, and it's, you know, yeah. And, right, and the commentary, Christy compares the flying men to flying helicopters in real life, searching for runaways. He follows the train tracks to the end of the road where he has to start anew. At the start of the movie, we see a man taking a bite of an apple who's then told to run because the firemen know he has books. Reading a book is the original sin. And, you know, some people don't think about, you know, what was the, you know, what was the sin? Well, the sin was knowledge, you know. So, yeah, it, it's a really excellent, and, and it's, yeah. And, and the robe guy reason is like a monk's robe. Right, and, okay, I'm not going to read all of this. I, I made a bunch of notes uh, as I was listening to the book. Right, just a, yeah, some, in the book, the play provides Linda lines. She doesn't have to come up with her own. And I, I like that change. I think it's better in the movie. Right, in the book, Linda doesn't care how expensive another TV would be. She just says he's being selfish for not agreeing to spend a lot of money on her. Misogyny, it really comes across like a white male stand-up comedian act. Did they have stand-up when the book was written? What am I saying? They've, they've always had stand-up. When women drew on cave walls to help improve the hunt, there were white male stand-up comedians whining about every single aspect of it. It is amusing that she insists they replace the fourth wall with a TV, which would, of course, require breaking the fourth wall. Which I don't, you know, I don't think that was an intentional, but it's just, it's a funny... You know, yeah. 
Guy is mad about the loud car engine, keeps them from talking to each other when she's driving fast, the lack of context in the TV shows that are about people arguing with each other. And like like I said, the, the car thing is like, dude, just, like, we get it. Cars were driving fast at the time, and he wasn't a fan, but... And it is, like, to be clear, there are... There was there were some problems at that the when he was writing the book there were people getting run over because people were speeding like crazy I forget if it was maybe was it the thing of like cars were suddenly allowed to be faster or was it I forget but I I believe there is like a you know yeah but it just it has nothing to do with fascism but then you know some say that the book isn't really about fascism as much as it's a criticism of television and to that like dude there's other there's better ways to criticize television without like making it like ah crap i forget who wrote it but there's this really great short story it's you know written short story that's like about how if television if everyone was obsessed with reality television people would stop paying attention to actual reality that story doesn't have any fascism in it so you know it yeah some of the book really does feel like he's just taking together a bunch of you know of course you should hate fascism of course you should be critical of speeding and you know tv but in, just in general like media that is shallow but you know today you have books that are shallow like i've I've been fortunate enough that nobody has forced me to sit down and read many conservative books. So I usually just watch YouTubers I trust talk about them. And, like, from Jose and Jenny Nicholson, like, holy crap. Conservative books are just... I don't know how anybody gets through them. It's its its unbearable how, how shallow and just... It's, it's nothing but just arguing for the for their ideology and conservatism once again from Reagan and onwards has been on very shaky ground there's not a lot of you know I'll, I'll acknowledge that there used to be issues that conservatives did try to address before Reagan now let's see yeah, and the, you know, the the thing with, you know, the TV shows that are just people arguing with each other, you know, that is, like, it does sound like the, the, ah, what's the, it kind of sounds like soap opera, you know, and, and I have to admit, I've done everything I can to avoid watching reality television, so I don't know, but I've heard that there's a lot of people yelling at each other in that you know, one of the only good things about reality television, there's always context. Honestly, I don't know any English language media that has just no context. And, and yeah, at this point, I started to get frustrated, so I'm just going to read loud. Has Ray Bradbury just not heard of volume control? Why would the TV always be too loud? Let's see. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of, like, Linda forgetting... It sounds to me like she just has ADHD. It really doesn't sound like she just doesn't care, but I realized when the book was written, that was how people thought of it. Yeah. Let your wife sleep, Montag. She didn't even know Clarice. Lots of people don't care if their neighbors live or die. I wish that was different, but that's not fascism. It's city life. Like, why can't you at least wait until the next day to get the answer? She's not in the hospital right now. She's dead. She's still going to be dead in the morning. You know, un unless we're entering in some kind of zombie apocalypse, she's still going to be dead in the morning. And Montag makes one of those misogynist jokes saying that women talk on the phone too much. First off, it's social contact. Second off, Patriarchy would not allow women to work. Phone calls were a way for them to be active until the law was finally changed so they could work. And actually, let's see, I forget exactly when the book came out. I'm going to have it momentarily. It has the same title. It's from 1953. Yeah, I'm not sure women were allowed to, like, get jobs and such. So, like, what do you expect them to do? Just do nothing other than housework and talk to the husband like just it's it's so ridiculous people who can't like usually men straight cis men who can't handle that women talk on the phone 
you know, it's it's this that like a lot of guys are terrible communicators, you know, so why are you so upset that your female partner is a good communicator? Like again, like you could use like even if you're selfish about it, just you could ask her to help you become a better communicator instead of whining about how she's good at something that you're not. And the guy in charge of the fireman points out there is a similarity between school bullies and fascists. He uses the word torture in place of bullying, acknowledging the truth that they are the same. The book guy most recently stole is the Bible, possibly the last copy of it in that part of the world. Burn it to ash, I say. The world is better off without it. And through Faber, the book does recognize the link in modern-day America between Christianity and consumerism, which I really appreciate. And that is such... I, God, of all the books, like, do you realize how much terrible stuff is in the Bible? Like, the Bible is one of those books, if you come across it with no context, like, the only reason that I'm... I'm a lot of Christians hold it in high regard. One, a lot of them have never actually read it. Two, they've been told that it's important. You know, it's... Um, if you actually sit down and try to read it, it's just... Yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful no one has ever tried to force me to believe in any religion, which... Honestly, it's almost like I kind of I kind of would like to troll someone who tried because I am really stubborn. Got that from my mom. Stubborn as a mule, she and I, and uh, or she was, now she's dead. No way to be stubborn anymore. And yeah, I've, I, I have always resisted, uh, you know, if someone tries to get me to internalize values that I really, really disagree with, which is, you know, that there, there was an inter that's, that's why some of my teachers despised me. Like, they could not wait for me to leave school. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a very weird, because some, some of the time I was a teacher's pet. Like, there was nothing, there was this, when I was like 10, I think, I was, like, really short. Still am pretty short. I, you know, my voice had not gone through puberty. I was tiny little pipsqueak. And, like, there was this class... I, I don't remember what it was. It was maybe a music thing or a stage play thing or something. But there were... You know, it wasn't only the kids from my grade who were there. You know, they, they, were, they were from the entire... And there was this guy who was like, you know, he was pretty close to, to graduating, which might mean he wouldn't mind doing something horrible. And he was like, he was three times as tall as me, you know, had to had to duck to, to you know, whenever he went through a doorway, you know. He suddenly up and left before the class was over. The teacher immediately, you know, Go get, you know, go tell him that, that, you know, the, the class isn't over. Me, with my 10-year-old, you know, you, you got it. You, you know, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm in school. I'm here to learn. You're the person teaching me stuff. You know, as, as long as you don't say something that's completely ridiculous, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do it. Did not think for a second, you know, got out of my seat, opened the door, went after him. And he was like stomping out of there like he you know he he looked like he you know just like I don't know if he was going for a can of gasoline he had plans you know I I you know you know run after him pipe my tiny little pipsqueak voice up um the class the the you know it, it wasn't actually over he turns around. It, it takes a really long time because he's so big. You know, I have time to knit myself a sweater in the meanwhile. Looks directly at me. And at that point, it still hasn't hit me. He could literally, like, like just pick me up and crush me like a ripe melon, like, like a ripe fruit or something. Looks directly at me. Opens his mouth. At this point, still haven't realized... I could be in serious trouble. Like, the door was closed. 
No one's gonna get to me in time if he tries something, you know. Looks directly at me, opens his mouth. Oh, okay, sure, didn't know. And we, we walk back in, and, and like, many times since, I've thought, I am incredibly lucky that that did not go incredibly wrong. And to this day, I have no clue why he suddenly got up and started to leave, and like, you know, left the room, and then yet was so okay with just going back, like, I have no clue, but I am really grateful that this mountain of a senior did not crush my tiny puna. Like, it, it wasn't that I was, like, well-liked, and he would have been like, oh, that's too bad. No, just, I don't know. Um, maybe he was like, you know what? I can respect someone who's stupid enough to actually tell me to do something that I clearly don't want to do. And just like, um, okay, are we an opposite day? Is, is gravity still? Am I bleeding from the... Am I about to wake up and this is just a dream? What is happening? Okay, sure, I'll go back to class, whatever. Now, let's see, right, and yeah, so the book makes misogynist jokes about women thinking too much and badly about children. There are problems with that, but it's not about women, it's about patriarchy. For thousands of years, women were seen as their worth being only in their ability to give birth to and raise children, especially sons. Of course, some women are going to focus a lot on that. It claims that women are shallow when it comes to politics. Men are as shallow when it comes to politics as women. And that is partially the fault of TV, so the book does have that right. And again, you know, for a very long time, women were told, you're not allowed to have opinions about important things. Uh, Beatty argues against books using parts of books, and Guy doesn't know his wife or his house. I do 100% understand why people wish the Hound was in the film. And, uh, yeah, when, when the bombing planes fly over to attack the city, you know, Guy is like, my wife is back there. Well, not for very much longer she isn't. When I think about my wife's hands, they're not doing anything active. Well, patriarchy literally legally prevented them from working for a long time, including when the book came out. Wow, it's just, it's so, it's so obnoxious. I'm really glad that Clarice in the movie is there from start to finish. It feels really forced in the book when she dies after very little time spent with Guy, basically to hammer home that these guys were speeding is a bad thing. And I'm not the first to point out that since Clarice in the book is a teenager, Guy Montag is like twice her age, it is very creepy that they have a relationship. It's not like she's friends with his teenage daughter or something. It's a teenager and an adult who have a relationship, despite the fact that the teenager does not really like the adult's choice of job. You know, in the book, she basically serves to make him think of things in a different way, as younger people can for older people, so I do appreciate that. But in the movie, she's a full character. You know, honestly, in the book, for as much agency as she has, she might as well be a flyer with the name, Have You Considered Reading? You know, it's... Yeah, I, I do not like when female characters are only there to motivate male characters and really don't do or say anything. Like, did you really need to fridge a woman to make a point about speeding being bad? Let's see, and... Um, right, the... Yeah, one... Uh, some some critic or some quotes from reviewers. What I also found very weird and a little bit disturbing is that if you're going to talk about books being banned, I'm going to think of religious text first. It's clearly a non-religious society. In a religious society, it would be the non-religious books, but not one single reference of a Bible, Quran, or any other religion. And you know, at first I was thinking, oh, is this a Christian whining about? But no, thinking about it, it is true. Like the you know. The, the Holocaust targeted Jewish people, not, not exclusively, but they were one of the main targets, uh, you know, so, so yeah, it, it is kind of, because, like, you know, Mein Kampf is held up, you know, there's the thing about, you know, Nietzsche, oof, the Jews didn't like him, you know, but that's as far as it goes, yeah, that is, that is kind of strange. Right, and, and Bradbury says the book is a critique of the effects of television, not censorship, as the movie suggests. So, the movie is better in that regard, is basically what you're, what you're, that's, that's what it sounds like to me. I, I don't, 
why would you even make it a fascist society if all you're talking about is television being shallow? Like Philip K., including at the time this was written, had all, you know, he was like, he wrote a bunch of stories that don't have dictatorships, that don't have fascism, but do have, like, advertisements being really shallow. He wrote this excellent story where, like, the, the protagonist is like, oh, you know, as I drive home, there's just nonstop ads, you know. And then there's, like, this robot that forces their way into their house and breaks their table and then rebuilds it to show that they need it, you know. In case some weird robot suddenly forces their way into their home and breaks their table, obviously they're going to need a robot to fix the table, you know. And I love the story. It's such a great... I, I forget, I'm not 100% certain if that had come out before this, but, like, he did stories about fascism. He did stories about shallow media. He didn't feel the need to combine the two. It, it kind of feels like, dude, just write two different books. Like, I get it. Like, he had... I forget the exact details, but in the in the on the DVD in an interview, um, Ray Bradbury talks about you know a really negative experience that he had with this. Uh, I guess he was like a cop, and it was this completely unreasonable. Like, wh what are you? What are you even upset about? Why are you like? It's just basically just him wielding his power. Like he's just getting off on the fact that he can get away with it, basically. So I get wanting to write a book about fascism. But fascism and you know, if you're not if you're not talking about censorship, then why is the fact that TV is shallow and there is a dictatorship like those two things don't necessarily go together. There's places in the world that have shallow TV and don't have dictatorships. You know, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if it ever goes the other way around. I think all dictatorships that have television have shallow television. But shallow do television does not lead to fascism. You know, you need ideology for that. So, to, yeah. Right. And, and yeah, one person points out, can people own and drive their own cars in this? Maybe not. Maybe it's only the train. And, like, why is that a bad thing? Like... We should be trying to get rid of, like, personal cars. And, like, the movie doesn't even show there being anything negative to that. I, I think that might actually be just, like, you know, a, a French guy thinking, you know, if it's the future, maybe there should be a monorail. More than, like, can you imagine if public transportation was the only, you know. I mean, for one thing... Where else is, are, are the two of them going to meet? If, if both of them, or if at least one of them has a car, they're not just going to meet. Actually, how is it in the book? Because in the book, certainly he and the wife have a car. I actually don't remember. Is it maybe as he's getting into his house, she's there in the neighbor house yard or something? Anyway, I think it works much better in, in the movie. Right, and... Even though the opening credits were spoken, at the very end there is the text, The End. So maybe that's the movie saying, eventually the tyranny we see in the film will come to an end. And yeah, that is really cool. And IMDb Trivia notes, other than the contraband books, there are no written words in this film until the end credits. To enforce the fact that Montag's first re reading of David Copperfield isn't awe-inspiring experience for himself. Truffaut has Werner slowly and meticulously read everything on each page as if savoring every moment of the parts of a book that most people bypass instantly. Very nicely done. So, yeah, that's it for this video. Let me know. Did I rant way too much in this video? You know what? I'm going to assume that the answer is yes. You don't have to go easy on me for that one. I definitely went off on this. Uh, yeah. Um, rather, let me know, what is your favorite movie that tackles fascism and, like, censorship, you know, sur surveillance and these kinds of things? Uh, what? Yeah, what's your favorite, like, written sci-fi story, uh, you know? Bonus points if it's written by Philip K. Now, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell, like it's a fascist and they threw the first punch. I shouldn't say that. I don't approve of violence. The 
you know what, I'm not the right person to be talking about that because I'm not in a position where I'm very likely to have the state use violence against me. I'm not going to criticize use of violence by minorities who may have to do so to survive. Anyway, there should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like relevant playlists. They suggest a video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of Secret Invasion, the most recent episode available to myself of True Lies, the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of Scream Queens, I'm also doing a weekly episode on the, you know, currently it's two episodes of season one of The Bear, and, you know, either every week or every other week I do a video talking about animated Star Wars, and I'll continue to do so until I'm completely caught up, which I am getting very close to, and as soon as Disney Plus puts out a new Star Wars show, I will do that one Basically, I, I intend to do that one as soon as it hits. You know, pretty soon we're getting Ahsoka, and I am uh, so excited for it. Recently, the Thoughts videos videos talking about very similar to this one. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.